So you see the cities of refuge are intricately connected to the ministry of the priests and the high priest. Justice, mercy, and human dignity are inseparable from religious freedom and practice. Christ Church is the city on the hill. I'd like for you to think about some situations here that honestly are quite recent. Uh, June 12, 24, an elderly Oakland homeowner arrested after shooting a suspected burglar. A 77-year-old man, homeowner, is in custody after he shot and killed one of the trio of suspected burglars at his residence. Two men and a woman, at least one of them with a crowbar, breaking into the unnamed homeowner's residence. The three arrived in the area in a stolen Infinity Q40. Here's another one. Arizona rancher George Allen Kelly's murder charge downgraded to second degree in shooting of a Mexican migrant. Arizona rancher George Allen Kelly is accused of shooting and killing a Mexican national on his property on January 30th, 2023. Prosecutors allege Kelly opened fire with an AK-47 rifle on about eight unnamed migrants, migrants, he encountered January 30th on his ranch, striking the man who died in the back as he tried to flee. Two migrants in the group later told authorities that Kelly shot at them as well, but they were not hit and escaped over a fence back into Mexico. The man who was shot had been repeatedly cr crossing the border and arrested and taken back to the border. Here's another one. Lawful Chicago woman defends her daughter against a home intruder. Police take her gun. The single mother of two who has chosen to remain anonymous, recounted the terrifying moment when a man tried to climb through her daughter's bedroom window. Without hesitation, she used her legally owned firearm to stop the threat, only to have it confiscated by police following the incident. The incident unfolded around 10.45 p.m. East 69th Street, when the woman's daughter alerted her that someone was trying to, uh, to break in or to, uh, to come through the window. Quote, I just went into action, end quote. The mother explained, stating that her protective instincts took over when she saw the man hanging on to the window. After warning the intruder, she fired a single shot striking him in the leg. The man later identified was transported to the hospital in fair condition and has been charged with a felony attempting burglary. The emotional toll on the family was significant. Quote, I've owned that firearm for years, and this was the first time I ever had to use it. I didn't want anything to happen to my children. I would rather it be me than them. Despite her responsible use of the gun in what many are calling a clear case of self-defense, the police confiscated her firearm, her only means of protection. You see, these are just a few of the examples of cases where a murder could have or did take place. And yet we want to ask, was the person who or shot or killed the, the other person, were they guilty of anything? And we see how quickly these kinds of things can go wrong. 
Even the police can make wrong judgments. Even judges can make wrong judgments. Here you have a woman who had a gun for many years and never used it. But she used it one time to shoot one bullet to hit a man in the leg to save her daughter. You see, the cities of refuge were that kind of thing. They were there to provide this kind of safety valve, you might say, for uh, both in a murder situation or in an accidental death, especially for an accidental death. So what were the cities of refuge in ancient Israel? Why did God command that these be established? Here's some things we can take away from this part of the Mosaic Law which can inform our understanding of justice and mercy, freedom and forgiveness, and Christ and His church. This is why so much of the, the, the Ten Commandments were in most courtrooms of the United States at one point. It's why in, I think, if I correct me, I believe it was, was it Louisiana, that uh, Alabama, okay, that the Supreme Court of Alabama said that, the, that in all government institutions, the Ten Commandments should be posted, which the ACLU and other liberal, uh, God-hating, freedom-hating organizations are already suing the state of Alabama for. This is why. Because our laws are based on something. They're based on something. And in the past, they've been based on essentially two things. The, Jew, the, the, the Jewish Bible, or the Christian Bible, the Mosaic Law, that is, primarily, but some in the New Testament, and also from Greek and Roman writings about government and law and justice and so forth. So that's essentially... Uh, where it came from, that we could add and sprinkle in there some, uh, some of the uh, Byzantine Empire um, and the British Empire uh, as it was brought to us in the United States. But uh, that's where it came from. But where did much of that come from? Right here. This kind of, the Bible is giving us so much in this place here. So the first thing I want us to think about is the cities of refuge were quickly designated. When we look into this passage, we see that in the passage that I just read, that uh, just as soon as the land is divided among the, the clans of Israel, the, the um, cities of refuge are designated. Um, and then we see also the Levites are also designated their cities and pasture lands for their flocks. They were not allowed, they, didn't, they weren't given a whole section of land. The Levites were spread throughout the city. Very interesting, huh? Uh, cities of Israel. There's a reason for that, and we're going to get to that in just a few moments. But the city of, of refuge are a foreign and ancient concept to any modern reader of the Bible. But that doesn't make the concept bad or even dead. The system worked well for hundreds of years. There was no police, no court system as we think of it, though there was one, designating certain cities as, we might say, safe zones or cities where you might take refuge if you uh, found yourself possibly being accused of murder. Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe you were working on something together and something you did made a, a log or, or something else fall and hit another person and kill them. And at what were you going to do? Were you going to be uh, considered a murderer? Was that an accident? Was it self-defense? And so how do you sort this out when you don't have a police force, there's nobody to call, you know, 911, this kind of thing. But, there, but God set up very quickly, very quickly, these cities of refuge. Well, qu quite honestly, the reason for that is the sinfulness of man. I mean, even the colonists in the United States 
uh, would come over, you know, a hundred strong or so, and men, and they all automatically had to set up laws and rules among themselves. Those that were on the Mayflower wrote the Mayflower Compact, which is essentially a covenant between all of them of how they would treat each other on the ship and on the land. And you can still, that document still exists today. You can look it up and read it. Uh, so it's necessary. The Bible, despite its critics, places human life very high, especially when compared with the other religions of the world. The Hebrew scriptures spoke to many of the dehumanizing elements that predominated the pagan world in ancient times, such as the respect for slaves, women, children, private property, civil order, child sacrifice, adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, incest, rape, kidnapping, overtaxation, tyranny, and much, much more. You see, we tend to think of only the Ten Commandments, but the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Leviticus, gives a, it addresses way more topics than that. And it tells the Israelites what God says is right and what God says is wrong and how they were to deal with people who violated these things. Now, the difference is for you and me as Christians uh, with Israel is the law of Moses for them was the law of the land. For us, it's, it is a moral guide. It's a, a theological understanding that marks our faith and, and our understanding of God himself. But it's not our law of the land. But up until recently, the land we live in has certainly been influenced by the laws of the Old Testament. And those laws all elevate the value of human life. The Bible elevates the value of human life. And that's so important that we understand that because that's exactly the opposite of what liberals today, progressives today, accuse the Bible of. They say the Bible is unloving because it condemns homosexuality. They say the Bible uh, degrades women when Luke is one of the first books that we could see in ancient times where women are elevated in the book of, of Luke. It is very clear, scholars are, are very clear on this, that Luke, in the Bible, in the New Testament, that Luke uh, did, in his writings, did something that was so counter-cultural, even for the Jews. And that was that Luke often referred to the important roles that women were playing around uh, Jesus' ministry and so forth. He elevated women. And everywhere Christianity has ever gone, eventually women and children are respected and loved and cared for, and slaves are set free. As I said last week, there's only two nations in the history of the world that ever outlawed slavery. And both of them did it as a result of the influence of Christianity. And that's Great Britain and the United States. They did it without blood. We did it with the shedding of a lot of blood. We, that's one time we could have learned a lot from the Brits. Don't tell them I said so. <laughs> but understand that the Bible lifts up human life. No wonder the cities of refuge were instituted almost immediately upon the seizure of land in Canaan. Moses even appointed the first three of the east side, on the east side of the Jordan River as soon as the region was conquered. The preservation of human life and dignity was the cause of the Genesis flood, and Moses and Joshua knew it. What was the cause of the flood? Well, if you really start studying Genesis and you get really close to what the Bible actually says, what brought about the flood was violence and, quite honestly, slavery. The violence of slavery. 
that there were powerful people who were enslaving whole sloths of people, whole portions of the world's population. We need to see that God, though, hates violence like that. He hates this kind of thing, and he judges it severely. And some will say, well, the, the book of Judges is one of the most bloody books in the Bible. God told Israel to go in there and, and to wipe those people out. How can the Bible be elevating human life? Because this, and this is so important, that the Israelites were commanded to take Canaan and to put those people to death was not a racial or ethnic issue. It was moral and spiritual. These people in Canaan regularly were sacrificing their own children to these false gods. They were committing cruel acts of violence and murder upon their own family members. I told you a while back that uh, uh, one archaeologist uh, showing uh, an altar, of the, uh, and this was later, of course, this was after Israel had divided and so forth, but they, he showed an altar to Baal. Down inside of that altar were the bones left from a sacrifice. All these thousands of years later, still laying there. This is what God sent Israel in there to judge. It had nothing to do with ethnicity, race, or any of that. It had everything to do with their idolatry, their murder on a mass scale, and they had made murder and violence part of their religion. Sound like any other religion you know? So the cities of refuge were instituted fast. Why? The sinfulness of man. Moses, Joshua, they knew that it wasn't going to be long where even Israel, God's people, were going to need the cities of refuge. Then we see the cities of refuge were for righteousness and mercy in the covenant community. Verse 3, the manslayer, that's the man who, the manslayer is the person, he's the accused. He's the person or she's the person who either intentionally pre, with premeditation or by accident or by self-defense took another person's life. Okay, that's who the manslayer is. The manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there. So if you're working in the field and you accidentally take somebody else's life with some, uh, some uh, tool or something and you think, okay, I, I'm going to be put to death, you can flee to one of these cities uh, so that you can, your life can be saved and you can tell your story, okay? Um, and so the death penalty for murder was given in the Bible long before the law of Moses. Some will say that the death penalty is wrong, that that's an ancient part of Jewish law, goes back to the, to the law of Moses. Well, that's not true. In Genesis chapter 9, after Noah comes off the, flood, off the ark, God gives him, he, God renews the covenant with Noah and his offspring as he had done with Adam. And God tells them there, he adds something new. He says, I've put the fear of you in the animal kingdom. And he says, and I will avenge the blood or the blood of a human must be avenged. So the man who takes another man's life, that man's life should be taken. And of course, it does not mean uh, that by self-defense... And it does not mean that the government can't execute just law of capital punishment. It means murder. When the Ten Commandments says you shall not kill, it doesn't mean you can't go deer hunting. It means you shall not murder. You shall not take another person's life 
uh, in such a way when yours is not threatened, when you premeditated, you hated that individual, or out of cold blood, we say, we took another person's life. And so the, the Bible, that's what the Bible is condemning. But the Bible sees that capital punishment of a murderer who's been proven to be a murderer, that is actually the preservation of life. When the government refuses to enact laws that deal with criminals who take people's lives, they put innocent lives at risk. And so this is an actual protection of life. And that protection of life even goes to the person who is in self-defense, has to take a life, or has accidentally taken a life. It is just as important to God that an innocent person not be put to death as it is that a guilty person be put to death for a capital crime. We see that in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 through 6 and other places. But when the time came for God to reveal more of his righteous holiness to mankind, he did it through the Mosaic Covenant. So the, here's, here's, let me brief, really quickly give you the breakdown of, this, of the cities of refuge, what the concepts are. And you can see this laid out very clearly in verses, uh, in Deuteronomy, if you wanted to go there, four, chapter 4, verses 41 through 43, but also here in Joshua chapter 20, that the nearest relative was allowed to avenge the murder but with no deceit and no delight. So if somebody took a relative's life, the nearest relative to the, to the deceased, God gave them the right to go take the life of the murderer. But God says that you cannot, he says when you meet him, you're not to... Do it in a evil way. You're not to deceive and trap and things like that. But you were to confront him in that way. This is for the avenger. It also says that you should not take any delight in the execution of the guilty party. So there's no, no joy in this. This is awful. It's a painful thing, but it's a righteous thing. And it needs to be dealt with. You remember God told Cain, the blood of your brother is crying to me from the ground. You see, no nation wants to have its soil poisoned with innocent blood because God will judge a nation for that. So it's just as important that innocent people be cleared and protected as it is for guilty murderers to be put to death. This accused, uh, the accused could flee to one of the six cities of the refuge for protection. The land was divided into three regions, each having two cities of refuge, allowing for proximity for everyone in the nation. You could get to one of these cities from any point in Israel within 24 hours. The city elders questioned the accused before allowed to enter the gate. There's the first preliminary hearing. Each party to the congregation, we might say, the jury of their peers, sound familiar? You know what I'm saying? He says that the person who's allowed in the gate of the city of, the refu of refuge will eventually have to face the congregation of that people. What is that? That's a jury trial, <laughs> isn't it? It's a jury trial. There's a preliminary hearing at the gate of the city elders. Why are you here? Tell us what happened. They want to find out, are you a murderer? Once they're satisfied that he, he might be innocent or she might be innocent, they're allowed in the gate. But there's still a jury trial coming. The avenger, once that man or that woman is allowed in the gates of the city, the avenger 
cannot now legally take the life of, of the accused. The avenger now becomes the prosecutor. The avenger now be, goes before the jury, the congregation, and pleads the case as to why that man or that woman is guilty of murder and not self-defense or a accident. Okay? Each party to the congregation, a jury of peers, presents to the, the details of the person's death. A judgment is given which legally declares the accused either guilty or innocent. If the verdict is innocent, the accused is acquitted. But if guilty, the avenger or prosecutor then becomes the executioner. So we see that the taking of another human being's life is very serious in the Bible. God lays out this whole system to protect the innocent and to judge the guilty of murder. The cities of refuge were connected to the priests. It says, number, number one, I'll do this quickly. The cities of refuge, there's only six of them. But all six of these are also cities that the Levites are assigned. We also see that it says if a man is acquitted of the charge of murder, he cannot leave the city of refuge until, now he, this means he's been acquitted. He still can't leave the city until the death of the high priest who was is, who is there at the time of the hearing. At that time, once the high priest dies, then that man or that woman is free to go home, back to his family and so forth. So essentially what it's saying is, if it was self-defense, if it was an accident, there was probably some neg negligence on the part of the person. And so they're not put in prison, but they're not allowed to leave the city until the death of the high priest. So you see the cities of refuge are intricately connected to the ministry of the priests and the high priest. That's vitally important. It might not be at obvious at first, but it is vitally important. Justice, mercy, and human dignity are inseparable from religious freedom and practice. Do you see what God just did that by doing that? The execution of law and order and mercy and judgment is uniquely connected to where the priests are located and to the death of the high priest. Law is not to be separated from our faith. And so we, I think, in fact, most argue that the way that they would plead would be to a priest. They would go, they would speak to the elders, but then eventually they would wind up in front of a priest uh, and for their case. A secular society will devalue human life. Did you hear me? A secular society will devalue human life. A pagan society will devalue human life. Mark it down. History's already proven it. God shows that these are forms that are inspired of Satan who is at war with the image of God. And that is us. And when the Bible gives us this, it's not all about uh, what keeps peace in the community, but the main argument for why murder is so heinous is the creation of man, the inherent dignity of man. In the image of God created he him. As in ancient times or some places even today, if there is an image of the king and you deface it, it was a capital offense in ancient times. And why? 
because the reasoning went like this. You defaced the image of the king. Had the king been here, you would have done it to him. And when we lash out in rage and in violence and in cold blood against another human being that we take their life, we are actually lashing out at God himself because a person is made in the image of God. Lashing out at the image is lashing out at the king. And then lastly, the cities of refuge are a picture of Christ and his church. And, you know, to summarize this quickly, we could say the cities of refuge are a picture of the gospel. Here's a person who maybe is guilty, but maybe not. But either way, if they want to have refuge, if they want to have uh, a case heard, where, what do they do? They got to flee to the place, the city of refuge, where they can be saved, as it were. The names of the cities express, uh, A.W. Pink points this out, what believers receive in Christ. There were six cities, Kadesh, which means holy, Shechem, which means shoulder, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, Hebrew, uh, Hebron means fellowship, Bizarre or Bizar, Bizar, a for, means fortified place. Christ is our rock, our high tower. Ramoth is exaltation or height. We're exalted, as James says in chapter 1. And Golan means joy or exaltation. That's the, all the things that we receive in Christ. Consider the similarities with the gospel of Jesus pointed out by A.W. Pink. He lists 10 of them. I'm going to give you uh, nine here. The refuge cities were appointed by God himself. And who appointed Christ? The Father. They were given to the provide shelter from the avenger. They, set up, they were set upon hills, a city on a hill. In other words, that's what that means. You want refuge? If you were running for your life, all of the cities of refuge were on mounts where you could see them. Their paths, that's the next one, were clearly marked to get to them. They provided shelter only for, the, for those who fled from sin for life. And those who took refuge in the city stayed in the city. If you left the city, the avenger could then take your life. Gentiles among them could take refuge in the city as well. The cities of refuge were not just for the Jews. They were also for any Gentiles that were living among the Jews. They could go there, just like all can come to Christ and be saved. The high priest's death set them free. Did you see that? What set the man free or the woman free? The death of the high priest. What sets us free? The death of our high priest. Amen. Possibly you've heard of the President Reagan's famous speech, The City on a Hill. Have you? In that reference, the president spoke of America's role as a beacon for the light of art, culture, education, and spiritual morality. His son, Michael Reagan, wrote of his father's dream in a book with the same title. From where did President Reagan get the image of the shining city on a hill? The original source is the American Puritan, John Winthrop, who lived in 1630. And, the, uh, and it was a sermon he preached called A Model of Christian Charity. And he got it from Augustine, or the concept from St. Augustine in the 4th century who wrote The City of God. Both of these men were not referring to a nation. They were referring 
to the church. John Winthrop, this is an excerpt, he says, There are two rules whereby we are to walk one toward another, justice and mercy. These are always distinguished in their act and in their object, yet may they both concur in the same subject in each respect, as sometimes there may be an occasion of showing mercy to a rich man in some sudden danger or distress, and also doing of mere justice to a poor man in regard of some particular contract. He's referring to the church. He's saying that the church ought to be marked by righteousness and justice and mercy. And that is a mark of Christian charity. And where did he get that? He got it from the scriptures. Dear friends, Jesus is the refuge for sinners. He will hide you from the just wrath of a holy and righteous God, having died to set you free from sin. Christ's church is the city on a hill. Christ's church is the city of refuge. It's the place where we can go and be delivered by the King. It's a beautiful metaphor, isn't it? How we can see that even in this Old Testament city of refuge, it's all about the law and so forth. But even there, God put the, the picture of Christ, the gospel, and the church of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.